take your Bibles and go with me this evening to the book of Romans, chapter number 9. Romans, chapter number 9, as we continue our study through the book of Romans, and been a few weeks away from this particular subject, looking at the book of Romans, want to just uh, try to get back to some normalcy as much as we possibly can as a church, and so uh, let's look tonight at Romans chapter number 9, the first five verses of this uh, chapter, and then hopefully allow the, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight and just teach us from His Word as He would desire to do so. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose of the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, Father, once again, we're grateful to you, Father, for the opportunity to gather together into your house to worship you, Father, to uh, open up your word and to allow the truths of, of these pages to come, come up and and uh, into our eyes and into our hearts tonight. And Father, I pray that you give forth the, the, the truth from your word tonight. Help us to understand this passage. Help us to be able to apply it to our Christian lives. And we'll give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory for what you'll do over the next few moments together. For it's in my name we pray. Amen. Amen. As you come to Romans chapter number 9... There is a beginning of a new section in the book of Romans. Uh, as you study the book of Romans, you'll find out that uh, the book of Romans can be divided into three sections. Uh, Romans chapter number 1 through chapter number 8, uh, as the first section is, uh, is, is doctrinal in its teaching and as you begin to look, and as we looked at Romans chapter number 1 through Romans chapter number 8, it, the Apostle Paul really begins to lay a, the groundwork, lays the foundation for the idea and the doctrine of salvation. And we were reminded of the fact that all men are lost, all men are uh, in need of a Savior, are we not? And, and it, in, in those passages, but we're also reminded in, in Romans chapter number 1 through Romans chapter number 8 that Jesus Christ came and paid our substitutionary payment for our salvation. And so the first section of Romans is doctrinal. The second section, which encompasses Romans chapter number 9, Romans chapter number 10, and Romans chapter number 11, is dispensational. In teaching, and that deals with a future state that is coming. And we're reminded of once again the Apostle Paul takes you and I back to the nation of Israel and begins to show four things that are going to happen with the nation of Israel in a future state of uh, time that will come about at some point. And then the third section. Of Romans is exhortational, and that encompasses Romans chapter number 12 through Romans chapter number 16. Really, in all reality, the Apostle Paul could have gone from uh, Romans chapter number 8 and talking about salvation and what salvation does, and then taking us right into Romans chapter number 12, which Romans chapter number 12 really begins to bring it back down to here's salvation. Well, now what are we to do as God's people because of salvation? 
And so he begins to exhort you and I to live the Christian life. And that's what Romans chapter number 12 through verse uh, chapter 16 really speak about is what the Christian life ought to be and how the Christian ought to live his life. And so we begin to look at those sections. And so once again, Romans chapter number 9 is the beginning of that second section into the study of Romans. And it begins to look once again at the nation of Israel. And so as we begin to look here, we see Israel's past uh, as we begin to look at Romans chapter number 9. And we begin to look at, in the first three verses of Romans chapter number 9, we see Paul's love and desire for the salvation of Israel. Notice what, once again the wording of our book and of Romans chapter number 9. And, and I believe that God puts the wording the way he wants it in his Bible. And, and tonight as we look at Romans chapter number 9, we read these words again. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Notice verse number 2, Paul's desire. Notice Paul's uh, emotions, Paul's uh, concern for the nation of Israel. He says that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to to the flesh. And so we're, we begin to get a glimpse, we get, get a view into the heart of the Apostle Paul here as he's writing to the church of Rome. He's writing and he's speaking to a Jewish group here and how that he had a desire to see his own people, his own brethren, come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. He had a great desire for their salvation. Verse 2 said, he said that he had great heaviness and continual sorrow in his heart because of the, the waywardness of the Jewish people, because of the lost condition that he found his brethren to be living in. And, and I would say this evening that for you and I as a child of God, as a Christian, that there ought to be great heaviness and continual sorrow upon our heart when we see the waywardness of mankind. And when we think about the fact that there are those in our own family, our own friends, that have rejected Jesus Christ, want nothing to do with God, it ought to bring about some sorrow in our heart. It ought to bring about some uh, some heaviness about us that, hey, we're trusting Jesus Christ as our Savior, but they're not. You know, I, as I think about all that's going on in our world today and with the, with, with, with the, the, the restrictions that are being placed upon churches and upon individuals, and it ought to cause us great heaviness to see what the government is already starting to bring about to our churches today and how that they're limiting what we can and can't do. And that ought to cause us great sorrow. Knowing that, hey, we're just a few moments away, I believe, in our nation from the government really putting their thumb upon the churches and trying to dictate what churches can and can't do. And taking away our constitutional freedoms that we have to have the freedom of religion that we hold dear here in this nation. I'm still thankful to be a part of a free nation, but I don't know how much longer these freedoms are going to withstand uh, that we have, but you know, the Apostle Paul said, hey, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Notice verse number three, what the Apostle Paul says, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I believe what that is saying today and what the Apostle Paul is really trying to get you and I to understand and to draw from this passage of Scripture is that Paul was even willing to die and go to hell himself if that meant that some of his brothers, some of his brethren could be saved. And, and I believe that that ought to be a desire for every child of God. Now, I understand this, amen, that you and I cannot get saved for somebody else 
or we cannot uh, we cannot give up our salvation so that somebody else can be saved. It doesn't work that way. But there ought to be such a love and such a desire for our own brethren, for that, for those people that we rub shoulders with to be saved, that we would say, hey, if I could give up my salvation so that they could be saved, I would. You know, that's really what the Apostle Paul is saying. He said, I would make myself a curse from Christ for my brethren. He said, I'd give up my own salvation if that meant others could be saved. I'd give up the joys that Christ has given me so that someone that I love, that I desire, could be saved. That's, that's tremendous love, is it not? Well, isn't that the same love that Jesus Christ had for you and I? That he gave up the splendors of heaven? Robed himself in flesh, lived on this old sin sick earth, had his own people reject him. He was spat upon, he was beaten, he was mocked, he was ridiculed. For what? For me and for you. I don't think he got a good end of that stick, that good end of that deal. But I'm thankful he did, aren't you? That he, he went and he went to the cross of Calvary. That's love. That's love. He, he gave up all that heaven had to offer him so that you and I could have salvation. And the Apostle Paul said, I, 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 for I could wish that myself were cursed. He said, unfortunately, I can't. Yeah. You know, as a dad, if I could have gotten saved for my children, I would have. If I could have gotten, you know, if I could get saved for every person that walks through that those doors of this church as the, the pastor of Reno so Baptist Church, if I could get saved for the whole for the whole town of Reno so, I would do so. But unfortunately, I can't. The only person that I could get saved for was my that I could have salvation brought to was myself. And the only person you could get saved for was yourself. Oh, if we could get saved for other people, I think that most of us probably would. Just to show love to those individuals. And that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to get you and I to grasp this evening. Is that there ought to be such a desire and such a love for people. That, hey, we would, we would gladly give up our own salvation if that meant them being saved. Apostle Paul said, hey, I, I want to see my brethren come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. I want to see my own people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Over in Romans chapter 10, verse number 1, we see it very clearly. The very next chapter after this, the very first words of chapter 10, verse number 1 says this. Brethren, my heart's desire... And prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Notice he does not ask for prosperity. He doesn't ask for, you know, for them to be blessed. He doesn't ask for them to have all these good things brought about their life. He said, no, my prayer and my desire for my own people is this, that they might be saved. Because the Apostle Paul knew what was the most important for those individuals was salvation. And I dare I would say this evening that you and I as God's people, we ought to have that same desire, that same prayer for our own people, for those of Rio Doso, those of the cities surrounding us, those of our state, those of our country, those of our world that we live in, that they might be saved. That they might be saved. We've got to get back to having that desire, that, re, that, that love for people, and realizing that, hey, they need to be saved. The greatest thing that a person can do is be saved. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to you, and it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me was salvation. Oh, there's been some other greats in our lives, has there not? I mean, the day we got married, I'm sure, was a great day. The day that I turned 16 and got my license and I could start driving was a great day. Until the the until I, I needed to borrow my dad's car and he said, Do you have a job? <laughs> no. Then you can't borrow my car without a job to put gas in it. You know what that did? That 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 put a, a little thought in my mind. I better give me a job. 
I'm 16. I want a car. I better give me a job. You know, I, I want to. I want to be able to drive and go places on my own. And you know, that was a great day when I got my license. And you know, I mean, that, that day I graduated high school was a great day. I couldn't. You know, that was a, an exciting day. The the day that God saved me. The day that God called me into the ministry was a great day. The day that I stood on the stage, married my wife. The day that we adopted the boys. Those were all great days. But nothing helps in comparison to that day that Jesus changed my life and that Jesus moved in and that Jesus gave reconciliation and, and he washed me of my sins. The greatest day that has ever happened in our life is the day of salvation. And so we see Paul's love and desire for the salvation of Israel. But then verses 4 and 5 speak about God's love and provisions that he gave to the nation of Israel. Throughout Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, the, 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 the apostle Paul begins to list out the things that the nation of Israel had because of the, the relationship that they had with God. These didn't come from their own th desires. They, they, these didn't come from their own dealings. But these came directly from God. I want you to notice the list of things that they had as a result of Jesus Christ. And just think about these and see if that sound, if, if some of what the nation of Israel had sounds kind of familiar to what you and I have as Christians today. Notice, first of all, it said of, of God's, that God gave to the nation of Israel in verse 4 the adoption, the adoption of children. It said, who are the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption? Well, that sounds kind of familiar to me, does it not? Because doesn't in the God's Word in the New Testament, doesn't God tell you and I as His people, as Christians, that we've been adopted into the family of God? The nation of Israel was adopted by God. They were chosen by God. They were God's chosen elect. They were God's chosen people. And He chose them to use them and to bless them. And I'm thankful that in the New Testament day and time in which we live, He's chosen you and I as Christians to be the adopted into the family of God. And so they got the adoption of Jesus Christ. Look with me this evening at Deuteronomy chapter number 7, verse number 6. Deuteronomy chapter number 7, verse number 6. Notice what God himself says to the nation of Israel. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. That's what he said of the nation of Israel. But then when you come over into the day and time in which we live, he said that about you and I as the Christian. He said that we're a special people, that he has chosen us, that we're a holy people, that we've been set apart by God for his service. And what an encouragement that you and I have been chosen by God, that God would choose us. See, the, the fact that he would look down upon such a wretched group of people like us and say, you know what, there's something about them that I want. There's something in those people that I'll desire, you know, I can use that. I can, I can, I can take care of that. I can handle it. Now, what, isn't that an encouragement to us? That God would look at us and say, you know what, I can use you. I can, I, I choose you today. Man, that we've been adopted into the family of God. The adoption of, of children. There again in Romans chapter number 9, look at verse number 4. It says this, that who are the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory. It was the nation of Israel who got to experience the revelations of the Shekinah glory of God. Who? What, what nation was it that got to see the, the Shekinah glory of God as in a cloud of day? It was the nation of Israel, was it not? 
Who was it that got to see God at, at night as, a, as that fire that led them through the wilderness? Well, it wasn't you and I as the Christian, was it? It was the nation of Israel. They got to see the very glory of God. Can you imagine what that must have been like? I mean, I, I think back and, you know, as in my mind a lot of times I, I, I read through these Bible stories and, and, and you try to picture that. But can you imagine in the daytime there being this cloud that leads the nation of Israel and it being the glory of God? over that nation. At night, there's this pillar of fire that leads them. But what a sight to have the whole, to, to have to be held that and got to see that in, in that day and time. And what, what, a, what a glimpse into the glory of God. You know what? We get a glimpse into the glory of God, though, because we have something different that the nation of Israel didn't have. See, they saw Jesus Christ in a cloud they saw God in a pillar of fire. You know who, how we see God? In his word. We see Jesus Christ. We see God throughout the written pages of his word. And we began to look at and we began to see the glory of God that lifts off the pages as we open up the word of God. As we begin to read, we begin to meditate, we begin to look at the, the word of God. We begin to see God's glory. Look with me at Psalm chapter number 63. Psalm chapter number 63. Psalm chapter 63. Look at verse number 2 this evening. Psalm 63 verse number 2. Verse number one really kind of helps bring verse number two into light. It says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I, I, I would say that today we're living in a dry and thirsty land, but not in a, not in a day and time of where there's no water that we can't drink. But I believe that there's a thirst for the Word of God today. There's a thirst for the things of God today. But I'm thankful as a child of God that He is that one that we long for. But notice verse 2, To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. I think as a child of God, we should desire this evening to see the glory of God. To see God's glory in our lives, in our church, in our nation, in all areas of our lives. I want to see God's glory represented. It says, who are the Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory? Notice these words, and the covenants. It was the nation of Israel who had covenant after covenant after covenant after covenant made with the nation of Israel. Probably one of the greatest covenants that dealt with the nation of Israel was the covenant of uh, that was made to Abraham. We call that the Abrahamic covenant. Remember how God made a covenant with Abraham where he said, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. Oh, truly, he made of Abraham a great nation because it was the nation of Israel. It was Abraham who he made that covenant with and so we see that in Exodus chapter number seventeen, where he makes that covenant with uh, with Abraham. There's another covenant made in Exodus chapter number thirty four with Moses. There's a Mosaic covenant. Remember that the Lord made a covenant with with Abraham, and He gave Abraham a couple of stone tablets. You know, he was the first individual to, or Moses was the first individual to download uh, a document from the cloud. And because uh, it was the cloud that began to rot and he, he got those tablets that had the Ten Commandments and God began to, to lay out some things for Abraham or for Moses and he began to, I'll get them, I'll get them in, in line in a minute in my mind and uh, uh, 
he, he began to, to work through Moses and he gave Moses the Ten Commandments and then it was Moses then that he instructed on all the other aspects of the nation of Israel. It was Moses that he gave the building plans for the tabernacle, for the temple. It was Moses that he gave all of the law to. And I, I mean, just what a, what a great man of God Moses was. And God used him, and God made a covenant with him in Exodus chapter number 34. But then he made a covenant with David as well. He made a covenant with David that he would, that the Messiah would come through the line of David. And he used David for that. And he began to make that covenant with, with David in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And you'll find it again in Jeremiah chapter number 23 and verse number 5. But just you think about the nation of Israel, how that they have the very covenants of God. And those same covenants, that same covenant that he made with Abraham back thousands of years ago, where he said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, that is a covenant that is still intact to this day. And it's a covenant that is being imparted unto the nation that we hold to today, the United States of America. And I believe that that's probably one of the only reasons why that this nation is still being blessed the way that it is. Because as of right now, at this time in our, in, in our society, we're still an ally with the nation of Israel. We stand behind Israel. But I can promise this nation, if they ever turn their back on Israel, then God's going to turn his back on the, on the United States of America. Amen. Because that covenant, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, we're going to see that happen. Look at all these nations that have turned their back on Israel and see, see where they're at today. I don't believe they have the blessings of God upon them. The Palestinian nation, the Muslim nations, they hate Israel. They can't stand Israel. And yet, God is going to do a work in those nations and against those nations one of these days. And so we begin to see that here's the nation of Israel. They have the covenants. They have the very promises of God in their life. They had the covenants that God made with them. Notice what else they had in verse 4. It says, and the giving of the law. It was the nation of Israel who was given the law. Moses was given the law of God on the tablets. He was given the law of God direct from the mouth of God. There wasn't no wondering if this law was true or not because it came from the very mouth of God. I mean, he knew that, hey, this is true. I better, I better heed this law. I better hold to this law. And they had the giving of the law. I'm thankful that throughout the centuries and throughout the, the, the years that the law hasn't gone away. And we still have the law today in this blessed old Bible, this King James Bible that we hold in our hands. We still have what God tells us we shouldn't do, and we have what God tells us we should do. We've got the law right here before us today. They were given the law. The Bible says that they were given the service of God. That speaks of the tabernacle and the, uh, the temple service of God and, and how that God erected that tabernacle for service and for the high priest to go in and to, to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. And so we began to see that there is that temple. I'm thankful today that we have something in our day and time that, that God has put his uh, protection upon, that God has put his glory down upon, and that is the church of the living God today. And I'm thankful that God still protects his church. God still takes care of his church in the day and time in which we live. And while they have the tabernacle, we have the church today. And we have that very aspect of God's blessings upon it. They have the service of God. Notice verse 4, the last few words, it says, and the promises. Oh, if there was ever a nation that got to experience and got to see the very promises of God unfold before their eyes day in and day out, 
it was the nation of Israel, was it not? I mean, just seeing God's promise that, hey, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'll take care of you. You know, when he brought them out of Egypt, he promised that he would take care of them. And yet they always criticized and complained, well, are you really going to take care of us? You lead us out here to the wilderness to die. But yet the whole time in all the 40 years that they were wandering in the wilderness, the sole of their shoe never wore out. Sounds like God was blessed in the small details, was he not? Remember times that they came to the Red Sea? They've got, a, got Pharaoh's army approaching very quickly behind them. I can imagine fear set in, don't you? Right now we're seeing, we're living in a world of fear. People fear the coronavirus. People fear what all's going on around us today. I have no doubt that the nation of Israel feared because here they are at the Red Sea. They've got a, a problem in front of them and they've got a problem behind them. And they don't know what to do because both problems are closing in. Both problems seem to get a lot bigger. But then God intervened and he said, Moses, why don't you raise up your staff real quick? Moses does and the, the, way, the water parts. And the nation of Israel is able to go over on dry ground. Once again, God's promise that he would take care of them was fulfilled. And what do they do? They get over to the other side. They watch as the Pharaoh's army makes their way into dry ground. As, as, as the last Israelite comes out of the water, Moses lowers the staff and the waves encompass the whole army of Pharaoh. They've seen that. They've witnessed that. They, they got to see that with their own eyes. And then they get just a little bit further down the road. What do they do? They start complaining again. We had it better in Egypt. Lord, we have no food. Okay, here's your bread. Well, we don't want bread anymore. Okay, here's your man. Here's your quail. I mean, giving them everything. Lord, we're, we're, we're thirsty. We don't have anything to drink. Okay, we're in a desert. There's a rock. Moses speaks to it. Moses speaks to it, and he gets water. Moses strike it. They give, he gets water. I mean, that's a miracle in and of itself, because I've never seen the water gush out water that we can drink. But it happened then. And yet, what do they do? They go right back to griping and complaining again. Sounds like a bunch of Baptists, if you ask me. <laughs> always griping, always complaining, always belly aching upon everything that happens. We've got it so good as a child of God. We have, I mean, we have the very promises of God today, and yet we're constantly complaining and belly aching about something that really doesn't matter. You know? I know God's going to take care of us. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not fearful of what's around us today in this world because I know God's still in control and God's still on the throne and God's still watching out for you and I. And because of the promises of God, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Standing on the promises of Christ my Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. You and I can stand upon the promises of God tonight knowing that His promises never fail. His promises will never falter. His promises are true. His promises always have been true and they always will be true. Oh, I'm thankful for the promises of God. They began to see the very promises of God. It was the nation of Israel who God promised that the Messiah would come through. It was that it would he would be an Israelite. Man, what a nation that got I mean, they got to have the very Messiah. I wish that he had been a Gentile. You know, because then that would have put him identifying. But you know, we can identify with him today. Even though we're a Gentile and he's an Israelite, we can identify with Jesus Christ because the Bible says that he took on flesh. And he walked a road like what we would walk. He experienced all that we experienced. And so that way he would know how he can help better help you and I when we face those situations. But we have the promises of God. Notice verse 5. It said, whose are the fathers? Man, the nation of Israel, they had some great patriarchs. They had some great fathers in their nation. 
man, you, you, you think back and, and even before uh, the father of the nation of Israel, Abraham, I mean, there was Noah and there was Enoch and there was Methuselah and there were these men that had surrendered and given their life to serve God even before Abraham ever came on the scene. There was these men that really taught a generation how to serve God, how to live for God. Then Abraham comes on the scene. And God promises to make of Abraham a great nation. Abraham has a son. That son's name was Isaac. Isaac was a great man of God. Isaac was one that God used tremendously. It was Isaac through who through, it was Isaac's seed that God promised to bless and to grow the nation. And he did that because Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Jacob became the more well-known of the two, did he not? Because then Jacob had 12 sons. And really 13, if you, if you count Benjamin. And, and uh, he, But you think about all the sons that, that Jacob had. And man, the, the, twi the became the nation of Israel. He became really the father of, of the nation of Israel. And, and uh, he, his name was later changed to Israel. And he had all those men. And, and just what a, what a great testimony that individual was. And then Moses comes on the scene. Moses is the one that God chooses to use to bring the people out of Egypt. Moses is a lot like you and I in the sense that God came to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and I want you to command Pharaoh to let my people go. Like, God, I can't do that. No, nah, I've chosen you now. Nah, I can't do that. I can't talk right. I, I, I've got a speech impediment. Yeah, I do too. You know, growing up, and still to this day, the letter R has always been a thorn in my side. The other day, I was watching one of the, the very first video that I posted. I was reading there in, in, in Psalms, in the chapter I was in, and it, lo and behold, the very first message that I put on camera had a word in it that had two R's, one at the beginning, one at the end. I went back and listened to myself preach, and man, that sounded horrible when I read that because of my speech impediment. You know, I could try to use that as an excuse that God, I can't, I can't be used. I can't, I can't speak right. But you know what? God, God can equip us, and God can help us, even in spite of our weaknesses and in spite of our frailties. I, I've got a, a friend of mine that's uh, an evangelist. Uh, he was sent out of the countryside, and, or is sent out of the countryside. His, his name is Philip Crow. And uh, Brother Crow, if you ever talk to him, Brother Crow has a really bad, uh, he, he stutters. Very, very bad. And one time they were out to eat, and I think I may have shared this, and uh, they had gone to IHOP, and he had gotten pancakes, and he asked the waitress for butter. But, of course, as he's trying to ask for butter, he goes, can, can, can I get some butter? And he finally gets it out. So the waitress just being, I guess, trying to either get a good tip or just having a very good sense of humor, she goes back to the kitchen, comes back out, and sets a whole big tub of butter on the table. And she goes, is this enough butter for you? Of course, he just laughs. But when you talk to him, just in conversation, he'll stutter. But it's amazing to me that every time that man stands up and he and his wife sing, every time that he sings and he preaches, he doesn't stutter one time. You would have no clue that he had a stutter problem. But as soon as he's done with the message and you're going out the door to shake hands with him and you try to greet him, you're, he, he, good, 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 good to see you, brother, brother, brother Sutton. But then when he preaches, you know, when I think about the fact that God uses people, he used Moses, he'll use you and I. Even in spite of our frailties, he said, hey, if you'll just serve me, I'll give you the ability to do what you need to do. And so we think about these men. I mean, there was Moses, there was Aaron, there was David. 
the man after God's own heart. What a what a what a lineage. What a what a I mean when you think about the nation of Israel, I mean they had some patriarchs, did they not? And had some great men of God in their life. But when I stand and I think about and I examine the Christian faith over the years, from the time of Jesus to the day and time in which we've had, there's been some patriarchs that have stood the test of time, that have prepared the way for you and for me to be here today worshiping God. I think about John the Baptist and how that he prepared the way for Jesus Christ. I think about men such as Peter, who, you know, Peter in all reality had a problem with open mouth, insert foot syndrome. A lot of us have that same problem today. Uh, I, I'll, I'll attest that I'm one of those that, you know, open mouth, insert foot. But Peter had a, a problem, did he not? But yet, God used Peter tremendously in the book of Acts in that first church there at Jerusalem. And then a man by the name of Saul met Jesus Christ. Saul had a conversion, transformation, if you will. He was transformed from Saul, who was a killer of Christians, to Paul, a maker of Christians. I mean, what a, what a transformation. You know, if it hadn't been for the Apostle Paul, we wouldn't have the gospel today. The gospel probably may not have ever come to the Gentile people if it hadn't been for the Apostle Paul. What a, what a, what a patriarch. What a man that surrendered his life to serve God and sacrificed everything for the cause of Jesus Christ. You know what men like that give me the the help to do? And when I just look at those men, it just re reminds me of the fact that nothing is too great for God. I mean, I can do whatever. We can do anything for God if we'll just set our minds to it and do it. I mean, the Apostle Paul, shipwrecked, beaten, thrown in prison. I mean, numerous occasions thrown in prison, beaten, shipped. I mean, all that he went through. And yet, he constantly made comments and said stuff of, like this. He said, I count not myself to have, to have reached the area that I need to. He said, you know, he said, all this, all that I've gone through, all that I've endured, I count it but loss that I may win Christ, and that I may point others to Christ. He said, all that that's happened to me, all that I've gone through, he said, you know what? He said, I'm just thankful God allowed me to go through it. Now, that's a way to look at something, is it not? And yet, I think back, not even just Paul, but outside of scriptures, individuals who went to their death and upheld Christianity. Men that were had their lives taken, women that had their lives taken because they held true to the commandments of God. They gave their own lives. I don't know if you've ever read it, but there's a book entitled Fox's Book of Martyrs. That book is just nothing but individual after individual after individual who gave their life as a martyr for Jesus Christ. Those are some patriarchs that we have today. Those are some individuals that we can look back to and say, hey, if they can do it, we can do it. If they can stand the test of time, I can stand the test of time. If they can endure the heartaches and the hardships and the afflictions that came about, then I can as well. I'm thankful for the patriarchs. Whose are the fathers? Those individuals who went before us, paving the way so that we could stand here today. And let's just get it down to where we're at right here at Rio Doso. I'm thankful for Brother Wayne Joyce who paved the way.
so that this church, 62 years later, could still be standing, could still be in operation, still going strong, still going for the cause of Jesus Christ here in Rio Doso. Hey, men, those fathers that have gone before us, those patriarchs. But then notice lastly, he said, if that was not enough, notice this. He said, you've got Jesus Christ. You've got Jesus. And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever. Amen. Amen. Hey, nation of Israel, let me just remind you, Paul said, he said, I just want you to remember that fact that Jesus Christ was a Jew. Jesus Christ came from the Jewish lineage. Jesus Christ came through the, the, the nation of Israel. He goes, don't ever forget that you have Jesus. Christian, let me just say this evening, don't ever forget that you have Jesus. Don't ever forget that Jesus is still there. The same Jesus that Paul spoke about in Romans chapter number 9, verse number 5, is the same Jesus that we gather today to worship. We have Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this evening, Father, we're grateful to you for your love, your mercy, and your goodness to us. Father, I pray tonight that you would take this study in the book of Romans, Father, and just use it for your honor and for your glory. Father, bring us back at the next appointed time, and we'll give you all honor, all praise, for it's in thy name we pray. Amen.